This week's episodes were brought to you thanks to the generous support of Bunny. Hey folks, Quillyteen here, and welcome to another tutorial on Unity. We are building a base building game. It's part of Project Porcupine over here, and we're currently working on mouse interaction. We've got the screen that can be moved around over here, which looks great. And we've got this little circle thing that's following our mouse, which isn't exactly what we're looking for. We want it to snap to the tile that you are moused over. Now, there are a couple of different ways that we could do this. Um, one of the ways which would work very well and um, would cover a lot of cases. Classically, the thing to do here would be to do something like, um, let's say we would do a, a ray. We'd cast a ray into the world and see exactly which object it intersected with. And then we could set the mouse circles coordinates to be the same coordinates as the tile which would work, although depending on exactly how you do things, you may or may not need colliders on your tiles, yada, yada, yada. Um, ray casting might, you know, be a little bit slower than some other options. Um, we can actually cheat a little bit because there's actually certain things we can know about our world. In particular, the tiles are laid out one world unit apart. Like if I grab one of the tiles here in the inspector, right, and I click on this one over here, this is tile, um, 10 comma 11 in the name in our memory banks right in our data model of our tiles this is the tile in the world object array at x equals 10 y equals 11. well it just so happens that because of the way we have everything set up this is also its position in the world it's at in unity coordinates it's at x 11 or x 10 y 11 which means we don't really have to do a ray cast we know which tile we're over simply by virtue of the fact that um, as long as our mouse is between, say, um, 10 and 10.9999999, we're obviously over the uh, 10 column in the X's, which is not what I'm mousing over now, but, you know, imagine that to be the case. So our selected uh, tile, the tile we're hovering over, is really, really easy to determine. Um, Really, we could have a little function here, for example, right? If we do something like um, uh, this is a function that returns a tile. Um, and we do something like uh, get tile at world coordinate. It's kind of an awkward name, but, you know, gets the point across. So we give it a vector 3, and we want to know what tile is there. Well, that's really simple because, like, the int x is the coordinate dot x right except this is a float and again we want to like sort of round this down well we've got the ability to do that math f dot floor to int this will round down a floating point to an integer so if i'm currently at coordinate say 10.635 right in world space then this will turn it into x equals 10 and give me that and then we can say same thing for y. Just copy this, do that, y. And then we can, um, if we had an instance of the world, right? We have, a, like, if we had a world object, then what we're doing is we're saying return world dot uh, get tile at x comma y. That will give us that information. Um, the problem is we don't have an instance of world here in our mouse controller. How are we going to get that? Well, again, sort of in the, the sort of easy Unity way of doing it, what you can do is, um, what has an instance of this? Well, our world controller has an instance of the actual world object, right? It has a copy of the world object, which is, which is great. But two things, one, it's protected right now. And two, how do we get a hold of world controller? Uh, we could do a game object dot find because there's, it's actually got a game object called world controller that exists right so we could find a game object with that name but game objects i find are relatively slow and it's cumbersome if you ever uh, rename something then things are kind of become a little bit stupid uh there's a slightly better way one i like a lot better to get is um find object of type and then you can say find me an object of type game um sorry world controller 
this will actually return the first world controller component that Unity finds in the hierarchy. You can also say find objects of type, in which case it returns an array. And I like this a lot because at least it guarantees getting you something that is this type of object. Um, you not have to rely on things being named correctly in the hierarchy. But again, this is not necessarily the fastest thing in the universe. Um, we can make a few assumptions about a project though. There's really, there should only ever be one instance of world controller and in theory only ever one instance of world. Um, probably, yeah, sure. So there's a couple of things we could do to make life a little bit easier. What I could do is use some statics. So a static is something that exists, uh, it's not part of an object instance, okay? It's not this one world controller has this one variable called, say, floor sprite or world. Instead, it's the world controller class as a whole shares an instance of a particular variable. Um, and I could, you know, create a change world to be like a public static or something like that, but I think that would be a little kludgy. I think it'll be better if we do have something like world controller um, dot uh, maybe like instance or something like that. So we'll do a public static world controller instance. So this is a, a variable that belongs to all world controller objects as a group, as a class that is shared called instance. And all we're going to do is when we start up, we're going to set ourselves to be that. Instance we're going to say is us. Maybe we want a bit of an error here. If instance not equals null, um, then debug.log error there should never be two world controllers. Uh, ignore this. Uh, uh, well, no. Sometimes we can get a, end up with some weird behavior. But yeah, if the instance isn't equal to null, we'll throw an error and then just sort of keep running there. But something weird could happen there. But what this means at this point now is everywhere else in our program, we don't have to do or find or anything like this. We can say, hey, listen, world controller. Oh, did I? I made that a public like that, which isn't really what I'm looking for. I was going to do... This should not be public. Instead, we want a public static world controller instance property like this with just a getter. There we go. Okay, because I don't want anyone else to be able to change this, but I do want everyone in the entire program to be able to ask for this. And... I'd have to write it. Okay, so we'll do this. Uh, protected set. So this means this is a property that only within the world controller itself can this be set, but the get itself is public. I think. Did I do that right? I'm trying to remember uh, the, the syntax. I've got it going on in everywhere else, a piece of code. I'm just starting to second guess myself. Um, as to what this should look like. Yeah, public here, and then the get, and then we override the uh, uh, the protection level for set, and that looks good. Okay, so now we can set instance here, and then in our mouse controller, we can say, hey, um, get the current instance of it, and give me the world. Now, the world here is still, um, is still currently protected, so we can't access it from outside the world. So we're going to do the same thing. We're going to change it from a, from a simple... Um, like member variable, and we're going to change it to another property like this. The get will be public, the set will be protected. So no one can change what our, our world um, setting is, but everyone else can get it, get a copy of it. So world controller dot instance dot world dot get tile at. Ooh, like that. There we go. So we're transforming some world coordinates here um, into integers, and then we're asking for this. Now, every now and again, this will spit up a bit of an error because it's certainly feasible for our mouse to be, say, at a negative x and y coordinate or at an x and y coordinate that exceeds the size of the map, right? Now, luckily, we do check for that in, um, in the world 
over here where we actually have the get tile at, we do a verification here to make sure that the tile is not out of bounds. It throws up a little error message in the log and then simply returns null, which is probably fine. I mean, I could do some extra sanity checking over here to make sure that X and Y is within reasonable bounds, but all we have to do is check to see if we're getting a null back from here. We don't even have to do that here. We can check it wherever we're using get a tile at world coordinates. Um, either we'll get a, a, a valid tile or we'll get a null. So we're fine. So the question is, coming back to the circle a transformation position, where do we want to put the circle? Now, what I could do is I could just do this sort of rounding here, right? Because again, we just want the, the cursor to be kind of locked to the center of a tile when I hit play, right? I want to not, not sort of be here ever like this. I want to snap to the center of whatever tile I happen to have my mouse over, just snap to the middle, which I could do here because of the way our world is set up, our, our, our visuals are set up, simply by doing this kind of rounding and applying that directly. But I don't think there's any reason we couldn't do something like uh, vector three, um, say something like cursor position equals new vector. Uh, let's see, tile, tile under mouse is equal to get tile at world coordinates and we give it the current frame position, right? So we feed the current frame position to the get tile at world coordinate, which returns a tile. And then we can use that tile info, tile under mouse dot X, tile under mouse dot Y, and set a Z of zero. And then we'll just set the, the cur circle cursor's position to be equal to this. And again, we will be able to do stuff that will result in errors. Right now, we are not quite right. Oh, I know why we're not quite right. But before I get to that, let's go over to the left over here, and there we go, start throwing some errors. And why is that? Well, it's because we are so far over to the left that our X coordinates have gone negative, which are out of range, which is fine. All we want to do when we're in that situation, we, um, we need to check to see if this is null. So if it's not equal to null, then we start accessing it. In practice, what we might want to do is hide the graphic if we are we don't have a valid tile, right? Why not do that? That's pretty easy to do. So if, um, so if it's not null, then we move its position. If it is null, then what we're going to do is the circle cursor, we're just going to um, set active false. We're going to disable the object. And of course, we're going to have to make sure to enable it if we've got a, a legit position. So now if we run it, we should have the cursor appear and disappear depending on validity. There we go. Now, we are still getting these errors that are automatically being thrown up by the call whenever we're out of range. We'll probably want to clean that up later so that it doesn't spit this out for us. But for now, it's still a good idea to have it in our, our code. So what the hell? All right, so that's good. But as we saw, it's things aren't working quite right. Or are they? Here's the thing. Um, actually, let me go and put in some debug info, perhaps. Let me do that. Right over here, we're going to go debug.log. I'm just going to have it spit out our X coordinate every frame. And let's think about what's going on here. Okay, so what is my X coordinate right now? Here it's at zero. If I move over this way, this is when we'd expect the, the switch to happen. You can see my X coordinate in world space is only at 0.5. And right here, we're almost about to cross the one boundary and then pop. So the reason is that our graphics here, the anchor point of our tile is in the center of the tile. Okay, this is the anchor point there. So when we place this graphic at position zero, zero, the position zero, zero in world space is right here in the middle of this graphic. So half this graphic, so this is a tile that's supposed to be at coordinates zero, zero, right? Well, half of it overhangs the negative X and the negative Y. And then this point here is at position uh, X 0 0.5, Y 0 0.5. This point here is at X negative 0 0.5, Y negative 0 0.5. Depending on how you're organizing your game, that actually might be ideal. I think for us, though, I think it would be a lot better 
a lot better if our pivot point was in the bottom left corner. I'm just going to apply this. And the only thing that's going to change here is that graphically speaking, the bottom left corner, for our tile that's at 0, 0, the bottom left corner of the graphic will be lined up with the 0, 0 axis, and the top right corner of our tile will be at position 1, 1, or maybe like 0 0.99999 repeating, comma, 0 0.9999 repeating, somewhere around there. Um, but now it should, well, it doesn't quite work right yet. Yeah, you know what? I think life will be a lot easier if I don't change the pivot point of the tile, now that I think about it. There's going to be some things later on that I think will be easier if we leave this as is, because if we ever tell a graphic to be at position 0, 0, I want it to be nicely centered on the tile. I mean, as long as all of your tiles have the exact same um, uh, origin, it should all work out. But this way I can just leave it at the default of things being centered. So that's fine, but we do have to look at the other problem. So this could have been fixed if I took both the floor and the cursor circle, right? And I just switched both of them to have the pivot point at the bottom left corner. I believe that visually this will fix our issues. Right? And indeed, it do. That's exactly what I'm looking for. As I cross over this medium line, we do that, and there, that works out perfectly well, too. Because both graphics need to have the same pivot point basis, and in this case, it, uh, it they do. It's the bottom left corner. Um, and now, it's correctly like, this is, say, well, somewhere over here, but let's, let's imagine for this tile. Uh, what is this? This is tile 3, 3, 2. So when I'm here, right over here, I'm on the edge of my world coordinates of my mouse going from 3 to 2.99999 right over there, right? So if it's at slightly less than 3, it goes back over here. And as soon as I go to 3 and over, it's here. And then as I move towards 4, the second it becomes 4.001, it flips over to the next tile over here. So everything lines up very, very nicely. Yeah, maybe we'll do this. It might make life a little bit simpler. Um, I do have to remember, of course, that we're going to have to set our um, anchor point to the bottom left corner, uh, which isn't the default, but you know what? I think this will ultimately make life a lot better and easier for us. So now we get a nice clear indication of exactly what tile our mouse is effectively over. And we do it by transforming our mouse position. We give it a call, and we're explicitly asking a system to figure out literally what tile is under there. And for now, that operation is very simple. We just change the x and y to an integer, and then ask for the world coordinates there. If, and this works just because it so happens that the tile with the sort of internal index of 0, 0 happens to be um, in the Unity world space at 0, comma, 0, and spans all the way to, you know, 0 0.999, comma, 0 0.999. Um, if for some reason those things didn't match up properly, like if we took our world control over here and we moved it over, now there's not that direct sort of mapping from one to one. Um, and you'd have to do, you'd have to take in the, into account the position of the world controller and offset that over here. You'd have to do something like, you know, coordinate minus uh, world controller dot instance dot transform. And then, so you offset things and yeah, but that's a pain in the butt. If we leave everything at zero, zero, we'll be really happy. But do keep in mind, if you have a slightly different setup, you can still fix that. Okay. So that's half the battle, but there's really sort of limited usefulness to this exactly. What it's mostly going to be about is I want to be able to sort of click and drag and, and block out areas. And also, the whole reason for knowing what tile is under a mouse is because I actually want to click and alternate between, say, floor and tile to start off with. Later on, we'll want better building tools, but for now, we want to do that. Well, let's handle the mouse clicking and show that things are working really well. So first thing is we're going to update the circle cursor position. That's fine. And then handle um, left mouse clicks. So if input.getMouseButton, and let's say down this time, actually up. So this I only want this to return true if the left mouse button was released within the last frame. Okay, as opposed to this one, which cares about if it's being actively held down or not. 
So if we have released the left mouse button in the last frame, um, and if our tile under mouse is not equal to null, then, and I mean, the, I could have put an and here, but maybe we want a different behavior or something like that or whatever. So here, if we release the mouse button over a valid tile, then let's set the type of the tile. Um, I could hard code it to floor, but let's have them alternate. So if this is equal to tile type dot empty, then we set the tile type to be equal to floor, um, else we set it to be equal to empty. And remember, here, uh, whoops, there we go. Remember, here we're just changing the this data object. This is a tile data object as opposed to one of the tile view things. But when I change this, this is going to trigger the callback in world controller. It's going to trigger this, this callback, which is going to update our visuals, which is really nice. So now let's see if that works out. I should be able to click on a tile, like right here. Click, it becomes a floor. Click again, it becomes empty. Wonderful. And again, so I'm holding down the mouse button now. Nothing happens. But as soon as I release, there it goes. Cool. Hey, look at that. That's pretty neat. I like it. You know, at this point, we don't have to randomly generate maps anymore. I could actually maybe, like, sketch something out and then save it. Ooh, saving maps. We'll get to it real soon. Right, so we can do that. What I'd like to do is the click and drag to work, because that's obviously a function we're going to want in this game. We don't want to have to, like, put down the tiles one at a time, right? Probably? I don't know. We're going to want to click and drag at some point. Let's take care of it right now. Uh, I think we've got enough time to do it. Okay, so with that, we're going to have to change a few things. Ooh, are we going to have enough time? Well, we can do the preliminary. <clears throat> so... What we're going to want to do when we're starting a drag, when we push, um, it's actually going to be like two steps, right? We're going to want to know if the mouse went down, which is going to start a drag behavior, and then up is going to finish the drag behavior. So start drag, end drag, right? Mouse button goes down, mouse button goes up, can't explain that. What happens when we push down on the mouse button? Really all we want to do is we want to save whatever tile we're on or our position or something is what we're going to want to do. We're going to want to lock that in. And then when we release it, we're going to want to fill in the difference between two. Now, plenty of times what we're actually going to do is we're just going to push it down and release it in the same spot. It's just going to be one tile. But every now and again, we're going to push down in one place, drag it somewhere else and release. And then we're going to want to change all the tiles in between. So, um, there's a couple of different ways we can do this. We could save the mouse position or the sort of world position where we started the drag. That might be fine. Um, or, and I think this might be slightly more elegant for us. I'm not sure it makes much of a difference, but let's actually just save the tile, right? Um, tile drag start. So, which tile did we start dragging on? So right over here, when we say get mouse button down, what I'm going to want to do is say um, tile drag start is equal to tile under mouse. Now, sometimes this will be a null. We'll have to keep that in mind. But that's it. We just, we just store that for later when the mouse button goes down. Great. Then when the mouse button goes up, what are we going to do? Well, first of all, let's check to make sure our tile drag start is legal um and well yeah that's interesting what do we want to do in a situation where someone starts dragging outside of the legal um map zone right what if we start dragging here and go here and then release we probably still want to process that don't we so that means we're going to be starting in a place where there's no tile but we still want to be able to do that drag and drop. Or inversely, if we start somewhere where there's a tile, that's fine. And then we drag out sort of over here and then release. Well, we still want all these other tiles to get done properly. So I guess we're not going to store which tile we're starting and stopping on. We are going to have to store the actual position. So that's going to be a vector three. Um, and we'll call it something like drag start position. Okay. 
that'll, that'll be fine. So drag start position, and it's going to be the current frame position like that. Um, is that going to conflict weirdly with the screen dragging? Yeah, no, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> we'll find out. Um, so we're going to do it that way. And so drag start position will always have a drag start position. It'll never be null or anything weird like that. Um, it gets set when the button goes down. It gets released when it goes up. And it's just coordinates. So we will always have coordinates. So we don't really have to check for that um, at all. And nor do we actually care at this point which tile is under our mouse because we might not have a tile under there. So what we're going to do is we're going to start a loop. So we're going to do four, tab, tab, x, tab. So we need like a width um, that we're dealing with here. Hmm. We want int start x, and it's going to be equal to our drag start position dot x. Uh, but again, we'll do the mathf dot floor to int. So we're just going to transform this float, which is this x, to an integer. And that's going to be our starting position. And then we'll do an end x, which is going to be um, at our current frame position, dot x. Now, there is a possibility. So and what we're going to want to do is we're going to loop our x from the start until we get to the end. Um, I guess we're going to want less than or equal to. You gotta remember the situation where these two might literally be the same, right? We might have started, but if we're not really dragging, right? We just sort of clicked and released in the same location, then the start x and the end x will be the same. So we want it to go through at least once. So there, there's the possibility that x will be equal to end x and that's going to be fine. Um, but here's the thing, we're saying if less than, this works great or should work if we start from say, you know, if I go here, if I click here and then drag to the right, that's going to be fine because this one on, we're on the right is going to be larger than the one on the left. But what if I go and drag the opposite way? What if I click here and then move leftwards? So then it, this would never loop properly. But we can quickly just do an inversion here. If for some reason end x is less than start x, we'll just swap the two around. Um, so we're going to say uh, we're going to make a temp. Yeah, equals end x. And then we can set end x to be equal to start x. And then finally start x can be equal to the temporary. Just a little swap you do around here. And this will continue to work the way we're hoping. Excellent, groovy. Um, we'll do the same thing with the y coordinates. So I don't know if there's any, like a way, can you copy and paste or um, find and replace in mono develop within a selected block. I should probably try that, honestly. Okay, for tab tab, y uh, is less than end y, and it starts at start y. Boom. Okay, and for now, all we're gonna do is do something like this. Um, tile t equals uh, world controller dot instance dot world dot get tile at x comma y if t not equals null because again we could start or end or both of our drags outside of a legal boundary um, so we do have to check that it's not null if it's not null then we're going to set the type uh, to be equal to the floor right now we're just going to force everything to be the floor instead of sort of alternate back and forth is there any chance this works as is? I'm, I'm like, no, I must be forgetting something. Well, let's test it and see what happens. First, are there any syntax errors? Nope. Hit play. Okay, we still get a little cursory thing. I'm just going to pan over. So if I, in this empty spot, click and release, nothing happened. And if I drag, oh, oh, oh. We're getting off by one errors. But only in the Y? So it's literally doing nothing here. 
And the X seems to be working fine. Why is the Y not working fine? <gasps> I think I know. I think because we actually want this to be ceiling to int. Yes, no, maybe so. All right, let's think about this. Why is this not working, whereas this one is? It actually should be the exact same, shouldn't it? Um, start Y. Plus start Y. And then space, space, space end y plus end y this loop oh 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 i forgot my equal sign ah! all right that's why it's supposed to be a little equal sign there now i think we should be okay click a click a and let's find a nice empty spot right over here click and drag Hey, straight line works well. Backwards line works well there. Let's do a little short one, make sure that's okay. A little short one this way, that's good. And down, actually, let's do it over here and down. Everything seems to be working exquisitely. Okay, but obviously, it would be nice to get some feedback showing us the drag area at this point, wouldn't it? So what I'm gonna do is actually change this little circly thingy behavior. Um, so that, sure, yeah, if we're just like, you know, sort of moving around, this thing maybe follows our mouse, I don't know. But when I drag like that, what I actually want is sort of like every tile that would be in this box, I want to have one of these little circle icons on it to show us like a preview of the area where things might happen. And later on, we can update that with different graphics. Um, maybe a little preview of the floor tiles, or uh, maybe um, there'll be little red X's in tiles where you can't build. Um, it could still complete it, right? Like, imagine the situation where I dragged um, from here down to here, okay? These this is sort of like little two by two block. Well, these three tiles here might have the little circles that show that everything is groovy. This one here will show an X to show that like, no, this is no good. But when I release, it could still go and put the floors over here, for example. And this is gonna be valid, especially important later on when we uh, create sort of job queues and things like that. So we will have to put a cut in here, but in the next one, we'll try to show a nice little uh, drag preview. We could also do like, sort of a rectangle showing the drag zone, like literally from the point we're clicking to the other thing, but I don't think that would have the same sort of value. And I'm trying to think, most of these sort of base builder games, when you do these drags, what they do tend to do is give you a little ghostly image of what you're gonna drag out uh, there. For now, we're gonna keep using these little circle graphics, but later on, we'll probably make an adjustment where it'll show you a little ghostly preview of the floor tiles or maybe the wall that you're dragging out or whatever it is. But um, for now, for now, we're, uh, we're working pretty well. So yeah, we'll do a little preview thing next time around. Thanks for watching, folks. Bye-bye. Thank you very much to all the November supporters over at patreon.com slash quill18creates and to these mic check level supporters. We've got Alex, we've got Wes Oldenbiving, we've got Andrew, we've got Craig Mortel, Philip Nichols, Neil Blakely Milner, we've got Speedy Savant, we've got Valiant Cake Fiend, Radel Del Peso, Aaron Toivsen, maybe? Marius Field Vold, Tim Julian Auger Lafon, Steven Steger or Stagger, we've got Michael McClintock and Bunny, and also everyone who's just watched, shared, favorited, subscribed these videos. You really make a massive difference when it comes to uh, keeping these series going and making everything just interesting and awesome. And just thanks for watching and thanks for supporting. See you next time, folks.